Well, thank you for staying for a standards talk. Um, I do promise you, though, that the talk does end with a heat map, so uh, bear with me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so uh, today I talk about um, representing the body of work that our Genomic Standards Consortium has been endeavoring to do for the last 12 years. And as was mentioned, uh, the JGI was a founding member of this work. So what this involves is a community coming together to face a challenge. Much like the room here today, we came together um, at EBI initially. We faced a challenge as that data deluge was starting to crest. We could all feel it, right, just over our shoulders. Uh, we were realizing and we could see that we were all collecting data uh, in different ways. Uh, at that time, we were doing soil data, soil collections, and water sampling. But as we sampled those, the, those systems, we were recording the information just slightly differently. And as you can imagine, if you're collecting data uh, and putting the, the date in a different format, uh, if you're collecting uh, samples uh, from different depths of soil and maybe you use meters, maybe you use feet, how do you compare that data in a database? Uh, also realizing the amount of data that we're going to be hit with as the decade was going to progress was going to be massive. So as a consortium, uh, we came together facing these challenges and today I'm going to talk about the various applications of how we continue to deal with the challenges and how we continue to expand our research community and our, our consortium. We are an open consortium, anyone can join, it's international, there's no fees. You join for interest. Um, people have all sorts of roles, whether they're database providers, developing standards, uh, running research uh, projects, and I will talk about three different projects that I've been involved in, got me back into doing genome sequencing again. But this is a nice um, opportunity to really think about how we evolve as a community, how we come together to solve a common problem. Hopefully it will change. Ah, great. Community is the basis of building standards and this kind of scale. We cover every environment, every type of genome, and we, this continues to evolve as the state of the science evolves. If you were in the uh, virus talks the last two days, you heard some of this mentioned. We need to stay um, present with what is going on in the community, and we do that by building our community, by inviting people to work with us, by reaching out to others to identify areas where we can help in that effort. It's not just a system where you can build a standard, you know, the old uh, field of dreams idea. You build it, it will not come, people will not use it, um, unless you have this very strong community, and it's all very much needs-based. When a community identifies the needs, they're ingrained in it, they, um, they feel ownership to it. So they, I think it very, that was very much our model. So it's very much a, a build, you implement it, you repeat. It's like, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. Yeah? Um, the idea being that you can build a standard, but it has to be used. It has to be of utility to the community, and you have to continue to think of new ways to make it implemented, make it easier for people to use, make it um, relevant. As I was talking about community, we've been very blessed by the, the, the depth of interest and time people have put in. This, thing, this is over a decade this group has already worked together. Our community consists of over 500 members across the world. Here I'm showing you our current board members at the top of this slide, at the bottom our alumni members. There's a few actually in this audience. I'm also showing you where we've had meetings over the years. So we do very active outreach going to various countries to work with their, their researchers to tackle new problems that they're facing. Um, we also have um, board members represented on, ver on the various continents so that we can have this outreach. We can talk to students, get them involved as well. I think it's a very important aspect of the work. If we didn't continue to grow and evolve as a community in the different research areas, uh, we wouldn't stay relevant, but we wouldn't be serving our community either. Now, when you think about um, genomic standards, as, uh, there's, there's various applications I'll talk about. So, the one, first one, though, is modeling this uh, ecological system. How do we do that in something that's just a really a list of words that you want to collect that's pertinent? So initially, we have to think about what's important in a particular system. So in soil, what were the, the key elements that all the soil um, scientists wanted to collect so they can compare our data? Putting that into a system of standards um, is critical. Um, to be able to collect the data, but I think an even more critical component is working with the database systems where that data is going to be deposited. 
Um, if we just built these standards, we could use them for our own labs, that'd be great, compare our own data. But by putting them into larger scale systems, and I list a number of them here in the, in the blue uh, box in the middle and in the upper right hand corner, by having these members of these communities as team, part of the team, we're able to provide the standard in a system that can be utilized by a larger community. When we first started out, we were the depositors of this data. Uh, quickly within the first few years though, we started to see uptake in the community. Other people we'd never heard of outside of our own group were starting to build it. As we build larger um, systems, uh, larger communities, uh, this has grown quite a bit and it actually is quite satisfying that we are serving the needs of the community. It's a complex system. You have to think about not just um, the data collecting um, when, you're, when you're designing your study, but what are those samples involved? What's the material you're collecting? Uh, what was the geographic location? Um, what are the elements about the genomic sequence? The, what assembler did you use? You think that might be uh, consistent, but it's amazing how people write um, a different assembler name. Um, but if you don't report that assembler, that doesn't help anyone in repeating the data or comparing across uh, data sets. So that's why those uh, critical elements are included here. Again, we're at the, at the era where people talk about data integration and big data. Well, I think that if communities don't continue to, to come together and to discuss what the elements they need to collect are, that are important, we can't do the big data analysis. So fortunately, I think people in our community have continued to have you know, the thoughts and, and been able to give the time and the effort to discuss what is needed to do the big data analysis. And so this is really, I think, lend itself uh, to these efforts. And you'll see I mentioned journals here. I'll bring that up again. This is another very critical component of applications of standards. We had to get the journals involved and we continue to work with them so that the data being uh, in our publications can be recorded with the standards and that we require that the, the standards, for some of them, um, also get deposited into the databases. So this is our homepage for our consortium. Um, the URL is up in the, in the right top um, right hand corner. This it describes our various activities and how we've grown over the years. It's a great way for to, to get in contact with us. We have a mailing list. Many of our consortium members just get updates through our contact list. Maybe they attend one of our yearly meetings or sit in on one of our working groups. Uh, these are convened monthly um, to tackle new problems and they're open to the community, what the community needs. And they have evolved some over time. We continue to grow as a consortium. Initially, we just built standards. That was the first two or three years of working together. Then the various PIs in the project, we developed projects where we could utilize the standards. And what I'll end with today showing you are three different uh, environmental sampling projects uh, where we are integrating standards within the projects but working with those um, communities to I guess, um, specialize the standard for what they need. Because we built them, we have soil standards and we have air standards, human microbiome standards. But maybe you have a study that needs elements of each of those. Uh, we often work now with various research communities to build those together to make the data um, standardized from the very beginning. Um, you may be able to imagine when we started to work on the human microbiome project, the standard was just being created. So data got created first not standardized. We had to go backtrack afterwards when the standard was finalized and then put that into place to put that into the databases. It is so much easier and I'll show you. When you have the standard in place and you collect the data at that time standardized, it saves you months of work. It's cleaner, uh, less error prone. Uh, it's a real, we found it's a very uh, um, productive way to move forward. So the standard I talk about, we have this thing called MIX, M-I-X-S. That's our standard um, generic name for all of our body of standards. We started out with just one looking at genomes. But as you all know, um, the types of genomes we're uh, assessing, we're sequencing, have grown and evolved over time. So we, we, we've evolved our naming schema as well. Um, Additionally, we work with both the ENA at EBI and NCBI to develop these um, submission forms, the ones you, and uh, JGI has theirs as well. We all work together to make it easier to put that data in. But again, that's kind of an, that's an application of the standard itself to make it user friendly and to make the data um, hopefully as minimal and easy to put in as possible. So we probably spent two or three um, meetings that we had figuring out what was a minimal set of metadata. How could everyone in this room agree? What would the smallest number of elements we all could collect, whether you were doing you know, uh, water sampling in the English Channel, soil sampling maybe out in Minnesota, what could you all collect that would be the same so we wouldn't have lots of empty fields gathered? And this is the set of 10 um, parameters that we devised and then we um, implemented them. Another aspect of this, as I mentioned earlier, is the journals. Um, we had to figure out how do we communicate 
out to our community what we are doing. Um, we all were in on it at the beginning, right? This is our community um, working in a room together. Um, but we want to grow, we want to expand, we want to make this of utility to others. So this is just showing a little bit of the impact of the various papers we've published on our standards and the number of citations. Um, it's very heartening to see that people are using it. It does continue to grow. This also gives you a sense of some of the various work and various projects we've endeavored. Not just the standards about the genomes, but we really care about the SOPs that are occurring in the labs. We care about how you describe your genome project. Um, and this is just some other examples as well. Working groups are a really big component of the GSC, um, and these do evolve based on what the needs are of the community. So, for example, the genomic observatories. These are groups uh, across the world that are looking at ecological sites and what are the pertinent data to collect there. They are now part of our consortium, and we tie them into the standard for, for one example. And this is just really giving you a, a breadth uh, of ones. There's 21 projects that are on our site right now. Uh, I just gave you a few examples of them here, but it's really just showing you again, um, it has to be a flexible thing. Um, it's, it's a growing entity to have a consortium that's hopefully trying to serve the greater community on these needs. A little bit about our standard. As I said earlier, we had 10 terms we wanted to start with. Well, that was great when we were collecting soil. Uh, and water, and that continues to work fairly well. However, we needed other terms. So when the human microbiome project came up, we didn't have any terms about host, I mean the soil, didn't have host. Um, we didn't have things, blood pressure, things like this. So when the human microbiome project came, we started to expand. What I'm showing you here is our list of different types of data that can be collected. We call them checklists because each one has its own column or list of terms that are pertinent to that community. You still have those 10 required terms or so, but you have other terms your data can be richer. And this continues to grow. What I'm showing on this slide is how we've grown over time. For two of the environmental studies that I'm involved in at the top of the slide, we look at the built environment. So um, if you look down at the floor next to you, you scuff your foot on that rug, that's part of your built environment. Those are microbes hanging out in that rug. Or maybe the airflow, if you feel up, if you feel a little cold draft, these are elements of a built environment we spend a lot of time in that we need to understand how they impacted the microbes in the room, and then uh, we as occupants, how we also impacted the microbes in the room, and vice versa, how they may potentially be impacting us. So that's one I'll talk about in a minute. The other one's the meta sub project. We're looking at transportation systems around the world as um, a view into a city's life of microbes. How is that microbes moving around a city? How are the human uh, occupants of those systems moving it along? And then what are the environmental parameters that are important to study? Now the ones in blue you see here um, are ones you've been expanding on and working on the last two years. You'll notice a number of them um, are familiar there with the JGI. We are again trying to continue to work with our communities to stay at that forefront of the science to make sure we're serving the community. I think because we early on had people that were involved in the various large you know, strain repository, sequencing centers, projects like the JGI involved, we're able to identify as, as the science is evolving where we need to expand and we continue to work together. So this is very much an ongoing project. If people have areas they want to work on, please contact us. We're extremely open to it. I hope this demonstrates that uh, as we continue to grow forward. Now this slide I'm putting up too, um, again, community. It's, it's incredibly vital to what we do. Um, on this side of the individuals involved in this latest uh, viral standard put together, I think there's only five that actually were part of the GSC to start with. But again, this is again building a community, and we're just a small component of this. We weren't the leaders on this project, the JGI and the viral community were. But we could add our expertise and also bring this into the pipeline. Like I said earlier, we have the standard, we've implemented it into the systems. By doing that, when new standards come up, we can bring them into that system. They don't have to create a whole new system. How do you get people to use it? How do you get them to submit data that's compliant to it? So that's, that's part of the effort there. When we look at the biosample repository, um, this is uh, numbers drawn from uh, NCBI. We look at what is our impact? How are people utilizing it? So like I said at the beginning, a few people outside our consortium used it uh, early on. Uh, in the last uh, three years, here's numbers that I've collected. We're getting close to 350,000 biosample records that are now annotated with the standard. It's having larger impact. Uh, maybe you go to a, a meeting like this and you hear someone do um, a comparison to the Human Microbiome Project. Or maybe they use Source Tracker. These are all projects that were impacted by what we were doing because the, the data within the projects are standardized by this standard. 
Again, we're growing a, a larger body of information, but this gives us all, which I love, a larger bolus of data to play with that we can compare against. That's really the win for the community out of doing standardized work and applying it to our, our studies is that we have these data sets then that we can go and do comparisons with. We continue to work to get journals to integrate a new uh, data policy to uh, get their submitters to submit um, standardized data to, across the mixed standard to um, NCBI or EBI, um, particularly the fair sharing program. One of our board members, Susanna Sansone, she's at the University of Oxford, they um, go out and work with journals to get them to buy in and, and really see the, the bonus and the, the positive aspects to our community for standardizing the data that is submitted along with you know, studies, like many of the studies that have been shown throughout the conference. These are the, the various journals that already have standards policies and work with our community to get that data in. Uh, and I think it's great that there's a growing body of news, even um, you know, Biomed Central as a publisher in general has a data policy. So we're trying to get to that level across the systems so that we're able to have better data um, from the very beginning. Now these are the three projects I mentioned that I would talk about. So these are very, um, horizontally, these are three different projects that are environmental studies, and this is where you're gonna see your heat map, that I've been involved in, but I think they demonstrate different models of how this can be applied. So in the top one, um, this is the microbiology of the built environment. We, as I said, we were looking at systems within buildings. You, uh, kindergarten, your child goes to the, the, the plane that you may go on later today, or maybe you rode the BART in here, all of those systems, we are very curious to find what's the microbial community and how it is impacted, but also the materials within that system. Even the International Space system, Station is part of this consortium now. So this model um, is fun, um, was funded by a foundation. So it's a community effort founded by a foundation, but working with our community as well to standardize the data. The middle one there, that's a subway project that I mentioned. Now this is a 75 PI plus project at this point. Uh, it is funded by foundation money, but also largely by um, sponsors, uh, industrial sponsors. And thirdly, I'll talk about one that the GSC itself funded. We funded this two years ago, uh, working with a, a local collaborator in Crete, uh, the Hellenic Center for Marine Research. We really wanted to identify um, an opportunity and put into practice with, it, with part of a, a meeting like this, we actually devised the last two days of the meeting to be a research study. So we could actually demonstrate how to collect and what that would impact in the community, a very large, very rich contextual metadata set. We decided to sample the soil across the entire island of Crete in a day. So we got everyone in the, well not everyone, I'll show you, but uh, we got a large number of people from the meeting to come together and go sampling for 10 hours. Collecting soil samples, but collecting very rich metadata. So we'll have the largest data set we can potentially get. And this is on a shoestring, this is a community project, but we, no one had sampled the soil across Crete before. So we're really curious what was there. How could we compare it? And by controlling as many environmental factors as possible by doing it in a single day. People, uh, when we had proposed this to various funding groups, they're like, you'd never manage this, there's no way. But we did, it was actually quite fun. But it was again community, people really um, from bought into it, were very intrigued by it, um, people at, uh, locally, um, as well as the researchers at the meeting. We know all of our time is quite valuable, but by um, integrating this into um, learning about the metadata standard, how to implement it, um, and then how to do the study, um, we, we hope that would come together. And, and, and it did, and I'll, I'll show you some of the results. Okay, so there's um, uh, the MicrobiNet. This is the homepage that Jonathan Eisen runs um, for the Indoor Microbiome Project. It's still a very active community. Again, I'm showing the different members uh, of that community. So this is a group that um, Paul Osuski at the Sloan Foundation pulled together. Building scientists, engineers, architects, microbiologists, bioinformatics people normally would never even talk to each other, generally, I mean, right? Um, but we all came together to identify different aspects of these built environments, because it's not just a room like this. I mean, it's your home, it's uh, that portable that might be attached to your child's school. How are these, all these environments impacting the microbiome in those systems and the human health as well? So we've all come together um, in the last five years. It's been quite a prolific project. There's quite a large body of, of literature about it now, which I'll show you. But I think it's, again, it's a really interesting example of coming together to fill a need. Where was a question in the community that wasn't being solved? By coming together in a larger group, we were able to do that. My, one of my um, 
contributions to this project was developing the standard. So we have our mixed standard, the basic, right? Um, we didn't have anything to really describe the components in a room. So how do you uh, explain uh, the, the, the wall coverings or the type of paint or maybe even the piping system within a building? There were a lot of number of individual researchers doing this, but coming together, we really thought about what aspects of those were the most critical to collect. And then um, when we conducted studies, we could do experiments on them to really see where the data fell. And that's very much exactly what we've done. So I worked with the engineers, the architects, the building scientists. We put together our own slightly extended, extended uh, minimal data set of, of terms to collect. And then we worked for about another year and collected a really long list. Because you can imagine architects and engineers, they wanted to collect slightly different things. But at that time, we didn't know what was important. We didn't know whether the material, um, the type of rug, is important. Is it important that it's a hardwood floor or that the table you're sitting on that's fabric covered or is it wood? Uh, what's the porosity of it? Um, when you ride the BART, that handle you hold, does it matter if it's plastic or fabric? Or that seat you sit on, um, does it matter what the material is made of that to be impacting that microbial community? And they do actually matter. Um, but we didn't know that, so we had to test it and we had to examine it. Um, so that's very interesting um, to see that. You may have heard in the popular press things like, you should have a dog because a dog actually brings microbes into your home. And actually, it's one of the findings of the studies is by having a dog that comes in and out, it carries that dust from the, your yard into the home and it re-equilibrates that um, should be a very natural um, system within your home of microbes. But by, by shutting a home out you know, down, the windows are shut, the doors are shut, you know, humidity rises, it changes the microbes that are selected to live there and hang out there, right? So these studies started to really start to get into that. Oh, also on a plane, if you came here on a plane, one of the things people found, um, sit towards the front and towards the, uh, the windows as far as uh, uh, if you can. Those are actually microbially your least exposure zones. It's not the person behind you that's sneezing, it's the people moving in and up and down the aisle. So um, I pick as far as I can to the window. Anyway, just the, the, some of them are kind of fun and interesting little tidbits, but also um, can be quite uh, interesting. When we're looking at neonatal intensive care units, um, if there is a sink in the room and there is a trap in that sink, that biofilm that forms in that sink, that's informing the microbial community in that space. So that's impacting the health of the, of the children, right? So things like that. Okay. The Moby Consortium, I mentioned I'd uh, list some of the statistics. So we put these together um, this last fall because we were wrapping up some of the studies. So it's had a really decent impact, I think, on the community to a point where a not fairly understudied um, part of our research is actually part, very mainstream. Um, one of our previous speakers even talked about the built environment. It's, it's a part of our vocabulary now. We think about w the spaces we live in. Before, it was dismissed. Pretty much five or six years ago, you tried to get someone to study that, to get funding for it, it couldn't be done. They're like, you study outside. You don't study where we hang out. That doesn't make sense. But it's an environment again, and I think very much so, um, the community has, has thought about it. And I was saying earlier, NASA, they're very interested. Think of how closed that environment is and the, how impactful on their health and on, on their living uh, quality their uh, microbial community can be. Okay. Now, just one last thing I want to point out is we had a wrap-up meeting last October that I chair at the National Academy of Sciences. We collected all of the, 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 the slides, but also made YouTube videos for each of the speakers. Some really interesting talks. It's publicly available on the MicrobiNet site. Uh, one I think is, you may find interesting to watch. Mark Edwards, he was involved in the Flint crisis. He is an engineer, right, building engineer, and they were looking at the pipes and the systems and Legionella and things like that. But go check out his talk. It's really interesting to see the, the story, the timeline of what happened from, you know, each of us doing a research study for becoming a, a public health issue to really trying to work an outreach in the community and, and uh, get those messages out. I thought it was a particularly interesting talk, but they're all freely available there if you want to go check them out. Okay, so now on to the MetaSub project. Now, Chris Mason in New York, he's at Wheel Cornell in New York. He, this is his idea. He's the PI of the overall project. Each city, and there's now over 75 of us, I think, has a different PI. We look at the subway systems um, in our cities, uh, from the oldest ones in Paris and London to brand new ones. Um, and and um, what's the newest one? Hmm. It might be in Korea, I think, one of the newest ones. Uh, and the cleaning practices are very different. If you go on a subway, you go on the BART. Um, I live just outside of Washington, D.C., and I can tell you that subway, not cleaned. No. Um, but if you go to Seoul and, and South Korea, 
it's clean so much we have a trouble getting the microbes off of, off of the surfaces. So really, we're, it's, it's an environmental study. We're sampling dust. When you have to explain what you're doing, it's, it's a swab. We go, we swab, we get dust. If you do it in the DC system, it's black. It's not because of the microbes, though. It's because there's oil from the brakes, right? Oil and then and the particles from the brakes, you can see them in the air. But what we're trying to do here is really get a survey by doing it in as close a time frame as possible, um, within a day or two of each other, if possible, is to understand where is the movement of microbes in the, in the community. There's another study called the Ocean Sampling Day, um, where they've done global um, samples, um, uh, waterways um, near the coast, out in the ocean, on um, the, the summer equinox each year, right? So we're trying to tie that up together to look at the, the oceans as well as on land and see movement, look at antimicrobial resistance, um, hopefully identify some novel biosynthetic gene clusters. When they did this in New York City, after one of, the, uh, one of the floods about five years ago, they found some unique biosynthetic gene clusters. So it gave us the idea to move forward with that and then and potentially see how iron and microbial resistance is moving um, around the world, within cities. And we got some um, Gates funding to actually initially do that. Now again, my role at the very beginning of this was the metadata standards. We wanted to collect the metadata the same across every city and every time we did it. When it was first done, people were writing down, oh, was I on 14th Street or was that 5th Avenue? And people will write Ave, Avenue, 5th. Data is very hard to compare if it's not written the same way, right? That makes sense? But if you're collecting ten, you know, thousands of samples to go back and fix it all, uh, it's very time consuming, it's potential to make errors, um, and it's not really an effective way to move forward. So we advanced our standard to include the types of terms that we'd need for the built environment, and then we implemented it. Um, this is the app we used the first year, and we have a slightly different app now. But for every single location, we pre-populate the GPS of every station, because it doesn't change, so we, we would know what they all are. Um, the name, the GPS, and this, the variables we need to collect that day, whether you sample the, the escalator going downstairs or the ticket machine, those are the things we select, and then it, and then it populates up to our database in real time, which is actually quite fun to watch. So as us, uh, people are collecting data, we have a online, there's a URL at the bottom. We have a sample map. We can see every single piece of data coming in, and we can see the different locations. Here I'm showing you what we added a feature this year. That standardized metadata I tell you we collect, we can now filter the data on the public site based on the metadata. And we are doing the, back, uh, the analysis on the back end, doing the same thing. But we also want to make a visual tool so we could see how the type of data was being collected and where it was being collected. So it's kind of fun to be part of this. Uh, it's a five-year project. We're in our, just starting our third year. This is uh, outlining that, that project timeline. So to date, we've got 15,000 samples uh, in the sequencing pipeline. Of those, uh, 3,200 or so have been sequenced. They are projected to be done in the next couple of months. And now we're doing the analysis to get our first paper out. Um, and we'll hopefully be continuing for the next three years um, to really get a nice timeline. We want that longitudinal data. OK. Uh, and this, um, it's another um, example of an application of doing this kind of work is the citizen science. We're training our students, our postdocs. We're getting community, member, community members to be involved in every city. In this case, this is Baltimore this last year. We got the mayor to come out. So um, trying to get the messaging out that microbes aren't bad for you. They're just part of our normal community. Um, getting uh, to be able to explain to riders when they're sitting next to you and going, what the heck are you doing? Uh, am I going to get sick from, from, from this subway? And no. From any of the studies anyone's done, um, you may have read Kerr's Huttenhauer's paper in Boston subways, there isn't anything there that actually is going to get you ill. If you go in and cough, maybe even have the flu, you go in the subway, you cough, 20 minutes later, it's gone. That community is very stable in each of those uh, systems. So uh, we, when, what we found so far is there really isn't anything that's going to get you sick. But until we test it and assess it, we don't know. So again, we're continuing to conduct the studies. Okay, last one, and um, this is a, a, a true favorite to, uh, to me and uh, to the Genomic Scanners Consortium because we devised our own study. We really wanted this very deep, rich metadata study, but we wanted to um, initiate a collaboration with our group uh, on Crete. So our annual meeting, as I was saying, moves around every year. Well, that year we had it on the island of Crete. We teamed up with people who were coming to the meeting, and this was all planned almost a year in advance, so everyone knew. And then we went to look at what was the pertinent data we wanted to collect about that community. So the island of Crete itself is quite fascinating. Uh, it's very large, yes, but uh, within the single island, you have everything from beaches up to alpine. 
Um, you can drive from the middle of the island to the end in about three hours. So it's reasonable to get around to do the sampling. But in each of these various vegetation zones, which are, are linked up to the uh, elevation, it's a very distinct plant types. So given the body of knowledge about soil uh, metagenomes and then how it relates to vegetation, we thought it was a very interesting um, system to look at. And, and it was also a great um, opportunity to be able to get out and do uh, collaborative science together. So see, on here we talk about the various ranges of uh, where we sampled, the, the amount of data we did. One thing we did do on purpose is every site we, sent, we um, identified is we did two replicates, three meters apart. So by location, we would have hopefully some um, reproducibility of what the data would be. We're starting to just look at that now. And we also did it a meter away from any plant. We're hoping to avoid the root um, associated microbiome or metagenomes. Okay, just a little bit about the data. Here are the various vegetation zones. We just couldn't quite get to the top ones this year. Um, it was a little bit too high in specialized climbing equipment, so that's hopefully next. But we did have a fairly good spread of samples across the zones, and the color code is really just to see. We really had to plot out carefully where we were going. Um, the roads are, uh, some are quite small, and we had to also plan not to be in a historical site, but also to catch those very specific vegetation zones um, across the island. There's a, a picture of some sampling. Again, really rich metadata, right? We wanted to make sure we collected as much information as we possibly could, as rich as we could. And again, we used an app in real time so that um, we could take pictures, record the data, and when we got signal, because everyone didn't have Wi-Fi or signal at the time, it all loaded to our servers. So we didn't have to go then write it all down afterwards. We just collected it. Okay, this is a, a little bit of information about the sampling. Um, we standardized the technique. We actually worked that out with uh, um, everyone um, involved. We subsequently did the soil chemistry, and these are just some of the averages and numbers of information. We did a triplicate of every sample collected, one for DNA extraction, um, one for the chemistry, but a third for archiving. So a third of our samples are all still archived on Crete. So if we find something interesting, we can go back and do more analysis. Um, this is just a uh, slide about the sequencing. Uh, we did a high seq. We did this at the Institute for Geom Sciences. That's my home uh, and, our, and our sequencing center. And you know, we were very happy. We got lots of reads. The, the read lengths were good. Um, all that worked out actually better than we thought. Um, I'm used to you working in dust, you collecting dust. Dust is really hard. It's really hard to get a decent amount of uh, DNA out of it. Soil, fantastic. Um, almost too much. Um, not really, but, but fantastic. So. Two things we did just at the end here for taxonomic assignments. We have the traditional chime pipeline for doing OTU assignments. We did, we downsampled um, to get the first set of information. Um, but then afterwards, I really wanted to get all the reads. And everyone's like, no, no, no. Um, it's the same. Downsampling will be fine. You'll get all your results. Well, um, and two weeks later, trying to do the entire data set, the machine was still running. So. Um, Jacques Ravel's lab, he does the vaginal microbiome, is one of his areas of work. He's at our institute. His lab had developed a system called PCAN, and this uses hidden Markov models to actually do the assignments. So in 10 hours, we had the entire data set taxonomically assigned. So if someone's interested in PCAN, this system was developed for the vaginal microbiome. Uh, the reference data set um, is tweakable. Uh, it was um, changed just so we could assess um, the soil. But if someone's interested in this for 16S, it's a really interesting system. Gives you some very interesting uh, results. We hadn't planned to do two taxonomic assignments, um, but this gives us an opportunity to compare the data across them, which we'll be doing next. This is just a slide on what the Markov model system looks like. Obviously, descending through the taxonomy to find the best fit models. Uh, we base this on, I think I have it on here, yeah, just uh, 10,500 or so uh, models were in that system. I think we're going to run it again because we're going to um, increase the reference data set. But the rerunning again, 10 hours. So awesome. Um, we can again uh, reassess it. These are the two top 10 phylotypes from each of those analyses and their, rel their frequency and their percentage within the entire um, data set. So we're just starting to look at this. It did shift, the top individuals did shift a bit, but we're gonna be comparing sample by sample across them and, uh, and uh, you know, obviously lots of other analyses. So pretty excited about that. Um, and this is um, the last heat map I mentioned, I promised. Uh, I circled some of the really interesting bits where we're looking at diversity um, 
uh, across the vegetation zone. So uh, you'll see more of this. One thing I really want to point out is we do this purposely as a public data set. The sequence is already submitted. The metadata that I needed to get this done, I finished last week. It'll go into EBI next week, and it's open to the world to use. And we'll be publishing about that. That's the idea is to, because we don't, we didn't have um, stipulations of, of when it had to be released. But we're very much, I mean, obviously, we're the, the consortium we are. We love to have the data public and, and everyone to use it and to do as much as they want with it. So that'll be, again, part of our, our publication, but it'll be out there. And lastly, getting back to community, we have our annual meeting coming up in May at Rob Knight's lab. Um, and these are the speakers we're going to have for that particular meeting. I know it's only a month and a half away. Our registration ends April 1st for this particular meeting, but you can still come. It's open to the community. In a year, we'll be uh, meeting in uh, Austria. Uh, again, we, it's every year, usually around May. If you want to join us, please do. We love having people share their research with us. And thank you for your time. I appreciate it.